Everybody. Welcome to Thursday night, Seattle Boat Show Live. I'm your host, Mark Bunzel, and we're going to be joined in a little bit by the mysterious Peter Schrappen, who's wrapping up another meeting, and he promised us he would join, and he'd have great jokes this week. So you can all come in on the chat line and, and uh, ask him about his jokes. Uh, I'm here with Larry Graff. He's going to be talking in a few moments about uh, boating up in the Arctic and some of the crazy things that he's done. And uh, uh, the pictures are incredible, the story's even better. And so stay tuned for that. Uh, like we normally do, we've got some announcements and uh, Leonard and Lorena are, are with mm -hmm. us and uh, uh, they're gonna go through and talk to us about some of the updates that are going on. And uh, we can talk about boat maintenance and a few other things. And just a reminder, we do look at your questions that you can Send in on the chat line and we'll try to get to them and try to answer them. So with that, Leonard Lorena, what's new? What's going on in the boating world? Well, we've got some news from Canada. You may have heard U.S. congressmen are uh, asking President Biden to uh, get together with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for a partial reopening of the border on Memorial Day and a full reopening on July 4th. Of course, this is just talk at the moment. Uh, nothing concrete, no schedule uh, made as yet. Uh, Canada thinks it's still a little too soon, but uh, at least they're talking. And uh, uh, Premier John Horgan in BC, the Premier of uh, BC, he said he would support uh, COVID-19 vaccine passport. So again, uh, that's in the works as far as discussion. Uh, he, along with uh, Trudeau and other provincial uh, premiers, they've been talking about that possibility of having a COVID uh, vaccine passport. So, so there's some hope, uh, still just talk at this point. I was just going to mention that uh, on that first uh, note that you had about the Biden administration and the group uh, going to tr Trudeau to ask to have the border open by uh, July 4th, and uh, they might want to change, just a suggestion, they might want to acknowledge that it's uh, July 1st might be a more important date or equally important uh, with July, July 4th too, just to have the, the right Day. political approach <laughs> to this thing. Right, we so. love celebrating Canada Day. If you've gone to the land bake on Saturna Island, it's fabulous. Uh, some news from Alaska. A couple of our field correspondents went to Alaska to visit family there and they reported that Alaska received more vaccines than they have people. So if anyone 16 years or older can have a vaccine and you may have heard that's true for Ohio now as well. And uh, the field correspondents said they, when they arrived in Anchorage, they were, they got tested for COVID and then tested again about four days later. And that is the recommendation that Alaska has. It's not required, but they advise that anyone coming into Alaska to please submit a travel declaration form online at, in their portal and arrive with a COVID, uh, negative COVID test, or you can have the test done when you arrive, which is what our uh, field correspondents did. And it's also recommended you uh, get tested again anywhere from five to 14 days later. And again, that's what our field uh, correspondents did and uh, went smoothly. Did they say whether there was a charge for that, for their COVID test or an entry to the, uh, in Alaska? They didn't say, no. Okay. Yeah. Supposed to put it on the Bunzel tab. <laughs> 
they did say that it was done right at the airport. So it was something that was right there as they, uh, as they arrived. Interesting. It is recommended to check with the local, the city and borough, just to be sure there aren't additional restrictions. So if you're coming in by boat, call the Harbor Master, they should be able to tell you any specifics for their particular destination or, or area. And then uh, uh, more or closer to home here and also to the Wagner Guide, we've been busy in the last week or so uh, with our COVID-19, the COVID table, the update table, or as we're internally, we call that the air table because that's one of the, that's the database that's used. So we refer to it many times as the air table and we've been updating that. It was uh, something that was obviously updated a lot last summer and uh, it was kind of quiet through the, through the winter. We know that things are heating up, voters are getting ready. And uh, so we've been uh, uh, doing a lot of updating, a lot of calling to find out what the marinas uh, plan for the, what their plans are for this summer. And uh, one of the trends that we are seeing is that the marinas are, are probably not, many of the marinas are not gonna be doing uh, advance reservations, long-term advance reservations. A number of them are gonna be doing reservations that are the next day or first come first serve. So reservations were a bit of an issue last summer probably because things, you can't make definite plans when things change so frequently. So just keep in mind, they, there might be some reservations, but they may not be long-term or, or out in the distance. Uh, the other one I want to notice, this, uh, this is just a be aware thing that uh, it was active today and uh, it's, an, uh, it's a safety zone off of the west side of Whidbey Island. It's not a restricted area, it's a military safety zone and it's about where Smith Island is again on the west side of Whidbey Island and about, uh, it's in Strait Juan de Fuca, Smith Island. And it's a safety zone that extends about a mile offshore from Whidbey Island and it's small arms fire. And it happened to be active today from eight in the morning until five and uh, there's flashing red lights and the whole works. So there's uh, military stuff and I assume what they're doing is practicing their aim and their, their gunfire with small arms fire and you need to stay out of that area. But again, it's not a restricted area. It's, it's labeled instead a safety area. It's a little, one of, it's one of those areas on the charts that you at, at first don't look at it and see it as a restricted area or someplace you might want to avoid. So just be aware of that. Um, and I think that was it yeah, for updates. I think that's it. Peter, did you want to talk about March 22nd? Yeah, Peter Schrappen is here. I got my boating shirt on, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Larry. Oh, yeah. Hi, Landon's. Hi, Mom. Uh, March 22nd, what, why is, now this is going to be weird. What happens on March 22nd? Phase three. Oh, uh, you know, you're further, uh, yeah. you've been reading the news today. You're further along than I am. Why don't you talk about phase three? Yeah, phase three means 50% uh, in uh, restaurants, 10 people max per table, still no bar seating, but uh, the, we, are seeing, we are seeing more people in the restaurants, that's for sure and then 25% capacity for sporting events. Yeah, the Mariners can go up to 8,000 fans. I didn't know they had 8,000 fans. <laughs> that wasn't like that, Larry? Um, no, it's great to be here. Uh, what, week 37 of this event, Mark? I, I think we're up to 38, but 38, we've got an yeah. anniversary coming up here. Pardon my tardiness. I was uh, whining and dining our outdoor recreation economy as the uh, MC. They all like the uh, glasses. Right. Uh, yeah. We had a big reception tonight, uh, well, virtually, but it was a chance to say hi to our friends who enjoy the outdoors. Uh, boating is the largest piece of that outdoor recreation economy, $8 billion of a $28 billion sector. So they asked me to help facilitate MC the event. So that was why, that's where I was, Mark, in case you were wondering. I'm probably that's fantastic. It was, you become was the nice. new Don Curley of the boating business. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess, yeah that's the best that's you can come up with. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. No, I'm, I'm following you. But I'm looking forward to tonight's program. I, I don't know much. I haven't seen Larry uh, outside of a boat show committee meeting in forever. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, Larry's adventure up north. Oh, yeah. It's going to be uh, going to be pretty interesting. And uh, so, Peter, uh, yeah. anything in the legislature this week? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been tied up with this uh, skipper chartered issue. It was a Department of Revenue back. You'll love this story, Larry. So Department of Revenue and I have been working on this since last March. And you could say easily I've been working on it since 2012 to make it easier for out-of-state vessels to visit without having to, to pay a crazy amount of taxes. So uh, Revenue got us a bill that was passed the House 97 to nothing. And then on Friday at 3.30, Larry, I got an email saying they're going to be opposing the bill. 
So for the last 110 hours, I've been working with them to, they're worried that Washington residents will create fake LLCs to then bring their boat here for 180 days. So I say, well, what about the non-Washington state driver's license? And they say, well, we can't authenticate that. Oh, boy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's having to prove a negative. So I say, how about a U.S. passport that matches with this driver's license? And they're like, how do we know it's valid? I, I, Cause it's a passport. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Help me out here. But we're not, they say, we're not trying to kill the bill. Like, well, you have a funny way of showing it. Cause it sure would seem like you're trying to kill the bill. So uh, yeah. Well, you're on it. Yeah. It's, it's what I did on the weekend. It's what I've done the last couple of days, but they're uh, it's moved to the ways and means in the Senate. Uh, so we'll have a hearing there where we can make the case. They, we had a, a House, a Senate Transportation Committee hearing on Monday, and uh, legislators just read them the Riot Act. You're telling me that you've been barking with NMTA on this, and now you're opposing it? I'm doing a little impersonation there, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's been not it's been not fun, but I don't know. The state should collect more tax from this. These boats spend a lot of money, and um, they buy a ton of stuff. There should be an amazing amount of tax that comes in from doing this. From your lips to God's ears, Larry. I think you and I all know that. We know that's the truth. And uh, yeah, yeah. revenue is concerned about fraud. Yeah, yeah. Think of the service work those big boats take, too. Larry, hi. I'm in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. All hey, right. Yeah, uh, so that's my story. Thanks. Thanks uh, for asking, Mark. It's been lonely. Uh, I, I know you're fighting these battles for us, and yeah. thank you for doing it. We do appreciate it. So, uh, so with that, we're going to go on to our main presentation tonight. Peter, we're on to the circle. Mark, uh, be yeah. just before we uh, head into that, there was a chat question I wanted to address for a second. The, the, it, uh, somebody put a question up there about the new federal law regarding uh, ignition lanyards. And there, it goes into effect of April 1st, and it does, it's a federal uh, law mandate, uh, but the states need to adopt it as a law as well. Uh, but right now there's no, the enforcement is really an education and it has, it's, it's a further requirement and more strict requirement for uh, the, the, the lanyards for outboard motors and anything where a helm station is outside where you might fall overboard and, uh, and possibly get run over by your own boat. Uh, so the, in, a, in a brief statement, that's what it is. It goes into effect April 1st. And again, the Coast Guard is planning to do education right now and not uh, uh, fining or, or uh, any uh, mainly education, so. All right, I guess we'll have to have a complete show about stylish lanyards for your rib. So. Electronic ones too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, now, now we're going to go on to the wild, <laughs> crazy, and incredibly inventive Larry Graff. And uh, Larry's gonna talk to us about some of the boats that he's done and developed and designed and then Larry not only designs them and manufactures them, but he likes to go off and show the world all the great things you can do on, on an Aspen Power Cat. So uh, with that, Larry, what is this? An Aspen Power Cat to the Arctic Circle? What were you thinking? <laughs> well, you know, I get these crazy ideas every once in a while. And, um, you know, my, my wife would definitely concur that I'm, I've got a loose screw occasionally, but I also just kind of get this restless feeling that I need to go try something new that maybe has been done before. Kind of, I got a little bit of the go where no man's gone before in me. And, uh, um, and so, you know, and to clarify this, you've circumnavigated Vancouver Island. Unrefueled. Yeah, unrefueled. And that, that's, that's impressive. Yeah. But then you went from our area here all the way around to the East Coast, right? Oh, yeah, that was just another little trip. It was 10,000 miles. We went up to Alaska, did that kind of exploration with this new owner and then down the West Coast and uh, into the Sea of Cortez, spent the, uh, uh, he and I shared the boat and we went uh, into the Sea of Cortez, spent a few months there. Then we um, put it on a truck, took it across Mexico, resplashed it in Galveston, put the flybridge back on, put the boat back together. And then I ran it uh, along the, from Galveston over to New Orleans for the customer. And uh, that was a real adventure too. That's a whole nother story. But, uh, and then he picked it up and we kind of traded as it went around all the way up to Annapolis, Maryland. So that's 10, incredible. 10,000 mile tour. Um, you know, we had winds at least on my section of the trip up by Juno where we were, we left Juno with 25 knot winds, went to Haines with a forecast of 35 to 45 knots, 
and then uh, and it was blowing 55 at Skagway uh, that wow. day. And I, I wanted to do it because the magazine writers are always, you know, seems to be calm when they go for a ride. And my boats are really good in rough water. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. And actually going into Haynes, you know, the boat was great in rough water. The issue is, have you ever docked when it's blowing 45 to 55? Not well, not Things well. Things happen really fast. And that was a marina I'd never been to in Haynes before. And it turns out when you get inside the breakwater, it's not very big. So in 120 wow. seconds, we were on the dock. Uh, wow. You know, but it worked out. Got to have some adventure in life. Oh, yeah. Well, when you're the boat maker and manufacturer, you know, you can always repair it. That's right. It's fiberglass. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, you tell me when to go to pictures. Um, yeah, let's just start this thing. All right. Um, this, this presentation, um, just, you know, it's one that we had put together earlier, but I think it's, it's pretty telling. This is, uh, one of our three buildings up in, um, Burlington, Washington. It's our main office area. Uh, real nice facility. Maybe one of the nicest boat plants in the Northwest. We can click forward here. Um, and, uh, let's see, there we go. This is a- Whoa, 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 Larry. This is, something's wrong here. <laughs> Did you guys run out of fiberglass or something? You've got one hole one side, and then the other hole is smaller. So didn't you give this customer the whole hole? <laughs> no, you know, that's kind of, kind of, I figured I could hide it in you wouldn't notice. The, the truth is here that um, the Aspen hull shape is a power proa. So one hull is larger than the other by about 35%. And the idea here was to reduce drag and to increase efficiency. So this is a boat that, for instance, our, our 32 footer um, weighs 10,000 pounds and is able to cruise top speed of about 24. And at 17, 18 knots, it's using six gallons an hour. So it's almost That's trawler, incredible. trawler type fuel economy, yet you have the speed and then amazing, amazing ability in rough water and 78% more roll stable. So it's an extremely capable boat. And yeah, it's a little bit unusual, but- But you ripped this idea off from the Polynesians. <laughs> That's it, you know, 2000 years ago, they started doing And this. I noticed <laughs> that you, you only give your customers one engine. One engine to maintain one propeller and the prop is in a pocket and fully protected, you know, except for in the outboard boats, but it still has, a, you know, the leading, it has the lower unit on the outboard boat. Full disclosure, Larry took us out one Saturday afternoon, the Landons, myself, and we had a ball. I didn't hear my name on there, Mark. Uh, sorry, we didn't We didn't get Awkward. you. Awkward. That's cool. Yeah. Next one, next time. That's yeah. it. It's a test ride. It's a shakedown we'll, ride. I we'll get it. We'll sign you up for one of Peter's trips. I mean, <laughs> it's one of fun, Larry's trips. It's a fun boat. It's super stable, soft riding, none of the pounding, none of the spray, and um, fuel efficient. That's what I love. Really also. fuel efficient. And yeah. with the price of fuel, they're pumping it back up again. Um, and in Canada, fuel's never come down. It's always been expensive. So it's nice to have a boat that, that the cost of fuel is kind of a non-factor and that still gets you there in a, in a reasonable amount of time. I agree. So There's what they look like. This is our 28 footer. This was the first model for an Aspen. Do we just, yeah, that should work. Um, this is our 32. This is one of the ones I've got. Um, comes with solar panel standard. Um, this is an open boat that we did the prototype on. And this is actually the boat that we took to the Arctic ocean. And, um, People ask, well, why did you take an open boat to go That's to the what I wanted. ocean? That's crazy. The thing was, this is um, a combination of things that I've kind of saved up over time. This hull is actually six different pieces of fiberglass that I put together in different shapes along the way. And I only have about $100,000 in this boat. And I was pretty unsure whether I'd be even bringing the boat back on this trip. The, the trip to the Arctic is such a crazy thing to do as we get into the pictures of this. And I figured if I'm going to lose a boat, I'd rather lose something that wasn't quite so expensive. And I'm sure my insurance company would have been happier too. But, um, but it's an open boat um, and it has big seat cushions up in front. We had a bow shell canvas on it where we could sleep, you know, out of the wind and weather. But that's basically as it went right there. Um, this is our new uh, C-107. This is a 34 foot outboard boat. And uh, starboard engine is a 200, port is a 70 on this one. And because the hulls are thinner, that's all it takes to have an imbalance um, is a 70 on the port side. And uh, there's another one here that's similar to this. It's a new 108 that has, uh, it's a little, it's a bigger version of that basically. And that's been really popular. We've been selling those 
They're really like hotcakes. That's um, the one we were on, the 108. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. can attest. It, yeah. it is handles beautifully. I mean, we're selling boats in January and February like it's July. I mean, it's been a wonderful year. Um, this is our 40 footer. This is the one we took around the United States and uh, single 435 horse. Now it's a 440 Volvo and top speed of about 25, cruise of 17, 11 gallons an hour. Kind of a great boat. Um, this is uh, the drawings for a new 52 that we're working on, wow. and we've got a group of 40 owners, um, our current owners, that want us to do a bigger boat, and um, big tooling project. I've got to got to school up some money for that one yet. Uh, give you an idea what the back of it. It's a big, big, beautiful boat. This is just a fun design project, but uh, we're always playing with new ideas. You know, I mean, I mean, I get up in the middle of the night with ideas, and I've got to get my yellow notepad out and write them down before uh, they I lose them. So. Um, so this you know, Larry, you could tie a pen to your hand. That's a technique that writers <laughs> like to use. So when you wake up with a dream, you could, uh, I'd recommend. Well. Drink wrap tape is better. <laughs> so here are some of the just overview details for this uh, trip to the Arctic Ocean. So on the river, it was 2,412 miles. So basically a 1,200 mile trip once we got on the river. To get up to where we launched was uh, 1,214, you know, whatever half of that is, a long ways. When we got onto the Arctic Ocean, we were, I think, about 424 miles from the North Pole, which is kind of way up there. Uh, sun never goes down, and that, that was fun. Um, Peter Robson, the partner in this uh, event, was just a wonderful guy, and he's done adventure trips with me before. He was on that trip when we went up to Haines and yeah. and uh, Skagway with 55 knot winds. So some of you may know of Peter. He used to be editor of Pacific Yachting Magazine. Fantastic writer, and and he yeah. wrote about this trip. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know he is just a wonderful guy. He never complains. Always got a happy attitude, and that's the kind of people you want to go boating with. Um, this is in here to give folks a flavor for just what what in the world we're doing here. So the distance from Seattle to San Diego is about 1200 miles. And the distance from Seattle to Hay River up in Great Slave Lake where we launched is 1200 miles north. So that gives you a flavor for how far north we are. Hay River is just inside the Northwest Territories and then it's another 1200 miles into the wilderness before you get to the Arctic Ocean on the river. So think about boating you know, from I-5 in Seattle all the way to San Diego through an area that the whole, the whole territory has 4,600 people that live there. And 80% and of them live in Hay River or Yellowknife, yep. which leaves, and the rest live in little villages all over the place. And a few of those villages are along um, the Mackenzie River. And, and so, you know, and I find these kind of trips, aren't there more bears than people up there? Way more bears. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I get onto these trips and I, I'm always talking to customers and people I meet about where they go and things that are interesting. And I'll, then I'll get on Google earth and start searching around, well, you know, where could I go here and there? And I'd actually, I still haven't done, you know, Cape Horn around, you know, South America. I don't know if I'm going to go on that one. With you, <laughs> I want to go on one of your trips, but I'm so, not sure about Cape Horn. You know, I was doing the math on Great Cape Horn. It's it's uh, you know it's it's like eighteen thousand miles down there. So to get within striking range is a real project. Yes, and, it is. And um, I'm still going to do it one day. But uh, anyway, this seemed a little easier than Cape Horn. So anyway, here's a flavor. So here here is the drive up to. Um, uh, from Seattle up to, um, you know, Hay River on Great Slave Lake. This was a two-day drive. And <laughs> the section that you drive through the Rocky Mountains is absolutely spectacular. If you get a chance, take that road and drive up there. Once you get out of the Rockies and you're headed up through this kind of, it's really flat and it's either farmland um, or uh, <laughs> lots of little short trees and really straight roads with nobody on them. You literally drive the upper part of this I bet we didn't see six cars in, in the last eight hours of driving. Um, oh, we did see moose, um, but that was it. Here we are, this is an overview of once you get on to um, Great Slave Lake and you're headed north, that's kind of the path of the river. It runs west for about 200 miles. And then uh, from there, it's another, you know, a uh, thousand miles north from there. Now, initially, if you see on the map here, there's Great Slave at the bottom, and then the next one up is uh, Great Bear Lake, and it's even bigger. 
And um, I initially thought it would be a simpler trip to drive up there on the ice roads. You ever watch the ice road yeah. truckers? Doesn't that seem like fun? No. And my idea was to drive up on the ice road in the winter and launch the boat onto Great Bear Lake in a cove, tie it up to a couple of trees. And then when the ice melts, I fly in in a float plane and we start the trip. Doesn't that sound like fun? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I started researching that. I talked to uh, uh, some of the folks that live in that area and they said, there's a really a couple of problems with it. That, that ice road trucker road, that they show you the roads that are easy. This thing, when it's off the lakes and goes through the tundra, it's, um, they said your truck wouldn't get eight miles down the road and you'd bust the uh, axles out of the trailer on, on it. Wow. So the vehicles they use to get up to that in the winter are different. The other thing they said, there's sort of a problem. The river there is only 12 inches deep and full of boulders. And so they didn't think a fiberglass boat would be ideal for the, the, the river there. So we backed up, kind of regrouped. I didn't really want to do 1200 miles on the river, um, but uh, there really wasn't a choice and it seemed like a great adventure. So away we went. Um, this, Look at that. That <laughs> is incredible. This is the braids at the at the top at the end of the trip. Um, this this uh, looks like the river that flows through here is one of about between depending where you are in the braids. This is an area that's about 30 miles wide, 70 miles long. And when the river floods every every spring and the ice breaks up, depending on how much ice they get last year, they had multiple weeks of uh, 40 to 45, 47 below zero, and the ice grew to five feet thick. Wow. And when it breaks up, it blocks up, and you never know where, and then the river is bursting down with all this water, and it basically punches a hole one way or the other, and the river moves all over the place you know, every year, wow. depending on how much ice. If they have a light ice year, um, then uh, it doesn't do that as much. But, you know, the last two years, they've had epic cold. They think it's kind of funny that we think they're warming up. They're, they're like, hey, the ice is thicker than anybody here that's ever alive has seen the last two years. So it's interesting. Their perception of global warming, global warming is a little different. Ice. Now, they have had some warm years, too. So anyway, it's a beautiful area, pretty interesting. And, and there's no charts. The part of this that's really interesting is they made charts in like 1978 and they kind of re, re, tried to update them through about the mid 80s and then they gave up because it moves around too much mm -hmm. and um and then and then uh you know so i couldn't believe that that was true this is 2020 here i mean now 2019 how can we not get charts for this river yeah. so and there's got to be somebody going up and down the river that's saving crumbs and you could get something now i tried everything you could imagine i talked to people fishermen and talk to locals and natives and the tribe folks and the guys that run the stores locally up there, there are no charts. I mean, you can still buy the charts. And what I what they do do is they mark where they, they there's some areas where these um, uh, uh, supply boats go through and they mark where the, the buoys are. But, um, but the buoys might be marked two miles onto land <laughs> and no idea how to get in. Can you imagine navigating with buoys that are on dry land on the chart. So I came up with the idea and maybe we'll come up with, I'll come into that later. So here we are, Peter Robson and Larry. This is in the Costco parking lot um, in Abbotsford. You were friends then. Yeah, still friends. And it's interesting, he stopped smoking about no oh, two months before this. And the story gets interesting. I'll just, just kind of keep that in mind there. Here we are buying food. Um, and it's interesting because I like spam. Peter likes spam. Um, and my standard fare when I'm on these trips is I get big, big tubs of potato salad and, uh, and uh, sliced ham. Okay. What more do you need? Works for sliced lunch. Sliced ham or sliced spam? Well, we do both, but you have to cook the spam. I mean, what? Well, I mean, Some sort of processed pork product, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my wife thinks I'm crazy. My grandkids are starting to give me a bad time about it when we go boating, too. But anyway, uh, it works really well when you're tired, you need some food. Um, here we are going through the Rockies um, and, uh, you know, that night, and, I'm, and I actually was testing the drone here, too. I, I have sort of problems with drones. I'm on drone four now. Oh, the yeah. Drones don't swim very well. No, they don't. All right. Uh, here we are going into the Northwest Territories, kind of a fun shot. Um, and, uh, you know, boats all kind of dismantled at that point. 60 degrees north. 60 degrees north. Yeah. 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 
the people up here are the nicest. I mean, that's one of the fun things with these trips. You get into these small communities with a weird project like this and people are super, super helpful. I, I think they're just nice folks anyway. Um, here we are after we've launched in, um, I think it was Peace, it shouldn't say, but Peace River. This is, we were gonna launch in Hay River, but we got up there and it was so windy that we couldn't, we, you know, the, we went to the Coast Guard station there and they're like, yeah, it's supposed to blow like 30, 40 knots for the next few days. And you really can't go out because the, the, the channel cuts through about two miles of shallows and, and uh, it's not marked very well. You won't be able to see these little buoys that are just like the size of a fender. And they said that it's so rough that you'd actually hit the bottom because at the bottom of the swells, you, you know, they really strongly recommended against going through. I was like, my boat's good in rough water. And they're like, no, that's not the issue. Can't get there. So we went. Larry, Larry, that's my mom asking, did you just say Pete's River or what did you just say? Peace River. Peace? Peace River. Peace River, yeah. not Pete's River. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's okay. just, less, uh, less impressed. Yeah. <laughs> It's just inside where the river starts. So you come out of uh, Great Slave Lake uh, heading west and it's a few miles there and they've actually put a bridge in now where you can you know, cross the river and, and go to Peace River, okay? So here we're, boats launch. It's interesting, um, it was really shallow here um, when the, when the uh, it got a little windier here and the boat was actually bouncing on the bottom. We had to push it away from the dock to, to make this work out. Um, this is um, the paper chart um, that, that we put together and, and we ended up buying the charts and um, they're huge charts that have about a 12 inch band of actual information on it, the rest is white. So we, we sliced them off and made three rolls. It looked like this, the scripts of Egypt or something and, and, and they were 104 feet of charts. Wow. And what do you do with that? And I've been on, you know, it's an open boat. It's going to be windy. So we made a device that um, let us a box that we could put them in and we'd roll them. <laughs> and it had a plexiglass cover that we could shut and open. But, but uh, you know, uh, I'll show you some other things. So remember this picture here. And then this was our actual route. And this is about 10 minutes after we launched. Do you guys see a problem here? We, we drive over a, uh, an island. And, um, and I was busy. There were a couple of tugboats and, uh, or river boats on there that, that uh, um, they hauled these barges. They were kind of in my way. And the current's like a conveyor belt. So while I'm thinking about how am I going to get around these guys, um, the current just drags me along. And I'm uh, not looking at the chart plotter. So these charts that we have, this is not a marine chart. This is a, um, a radar, satellite radar picture that is that Garmin uses for their, their, you know, hiking maps and things like that. And this is from 2012 and this is 2019. So it's seven years old. And uh, this was the best navigation chart we could put on our chart plotter. Um, and and you, you'll see some interesting things. You see how I'm backing up here, there's some zigzagging. Yeah. So, you know, we got around, after we drove over the island, this really concerned Peter that we were driving over islands. And, um, and I was like, Peter, we have five feet of water here. And, and, uh, and so, uh, but, but that zigzag there is, we were up at about, oh, 18 knots there with the current. Yeah. And, uh, and then it got really shallow again. And we did the first of what became sort of a every day, a couple times a day, you're cruising along at 18 and you realize, ah, the alarm goes beep, beep, beep. And you have no water. So what do you do? You either run aground or you hit reverse. And it turns out Yamahas are okay going from cruise speed to neutral to reverse. If you count to three between, you can be gliding forward at like 16 knots and hit reverse. And if it's really got to stop soon, you can go to full throttle and reverse. It'll shoot about a 15 foot wall of water up off each motor. Wow. And you stop really quick. And uh, it, you know, it was either hit the boulders and rocks or hit reverse. And uh, Peter started smoking about uh, <laughs> the second <laughs> one of those. <laughs> so pretty fun. Um, this is typical. Um, and you have to be willing to drive along because it's 1,200 miles. You got to be willing to drive along at 18, 19 knots with this on your chart plotter. Wow. What do you think of that? Yeah. Is that crazy or what? You know? Yeah. Okay, are we having fun yet? 
So the trip down the river is like this for hours and hours. You get up at 7.30, you're on the water, and you may be boating until 10. You could boat all night long because it doesn't get dark. It's a very interesting place. Okay, a few more islands. We're just cruising over. Now we're at the point where we're kind of getting casual driving over islands, you know? No problem. Um, then uh, the other question here is, what about the bears? Um, I had done some research before this, and on one of my other adventures to Alaska, we went down the Iliama River into um, the uh, uh, Bering, not Bering Straits, uh, Bristol Bay. And I had a bear that uh, we had a little opportunity with. Turns out you really shouldn't pour bacon grease into the water um, after dinner. <laughs> And uh, bears have really good noses. And so this, so I was a little paranoid of bears. This was a way to keep them from, and they swim like seals. I mean, they're really amazing to watch swim. Um, so this was our way to keep the bears off. We put and the bears, you're saying, what are you, polar bears, black bears, grizzly? Uh, grizzly bears are the big ones. The polar, the black bears don't swim too well. And um, yeah, this would, my, I don't know. I, I'm hoping this would have worked with the uh, polar bears. We didn't see any. Larry, did you pick up smoking also on this trip? I would have. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm just having fun, you know, ready to go. I mean, a little scotch at night, maybe, but that's it. Uh, anyway, the Yamahas ran beautifully on this trip the whole time. I mean, not just perfect. And I had brought extra lower unit for the big boat um, or for the big engine and extra water pumps. There's so much silt in this river. I was worried that the water pumps would wear out. Um, just from the sand in the river. And it, we took them apart, we replaced them, we got back, but they turned out to be fine. Uh, the other issue I was concerned about is, okay, so I'm running down the river and I don't have a chart and I don't have a chart plotter. And, uh, and how do I get off the sandbar when I hit it? Well, there's two problems with the theory. The, the idea was this latches on to the corner of the boat and, um, and the cleat. And my idea was that I would take the dinghy and my anchors and go up current and latch onto them, and then I would winch myself off of the uh, sandbar. And there are two problems with this theory. The first one is, it isn't sand for the first 600 miles. It's literally boulders that are six to 12 inches in diameter. So if we hit, it was gonna be a big event. Yeah. The other problem is the current, when, have you ever thought about trying to back off a sandbar, or what happens when you hit a sandbar and there's a six or eight knot current coming on you, coming into the stern? And uh, I didn't really prepare for that problem. Anyway, I'm lucky we didn't use this. Um, this hitting the bottom was a, an interesting thing. When we go to the little villages, the, every you'd get within four or five miles of them, you see these aluminum boats and they were super interested to come meet us and talk to us because a fiberglass boat of this size is something they've never seen before. Probably like an alien. Yeah, it's just like an alien, especially one like this. And we talked to them and, you, and, and one guy told me that he, on our trip back, that he was on his ninth lower unit that year. Wow. They buy them like popcorn and replace them. And he's like, how many lower units have you used on the trip? And I'm like, I'm on my original. And he's like, wow. Waters <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have depth sounders in their boats and the river moves. So we just either got lucky, we probably got lucky. All right, so we didn't have to use our winch to get off and I'm really glad. Um, this is uh, this chart plotter deal. We ended up naming the, the the box that held our charts Wilson because it was just like our Bible. It was like so mission critical, and and uh, Wilson was a huge help. Now this is this is a you know see a problem here. That's a buoy that's like four feet high. Yeah, and you a might bit of current. you might drive five miles to see it and find it. You can't find it with your you know, it's so far away. There's only ten inches of it out of the water, and uh, and it was just a ripping kind of an event. It was crazy. Um, here are the the heroes that helped us. This is uh, the Cooper family, and it's a family uh, business that has tugboats, and they pull these special. They have special boats they design and special barges that can do shallow water. And uh, these guys are in Fort Simpson. And through a contact that Peter had, we ended up uh, meeting the owners and on the phone, they became very interested, super helpful, wonderful. Um, they loaned us their truck. They hooked up the fuel truck to come get us. They gave us a place on the beach to tie up and uh, super interesting. This beach that we're standing on, 
Um, I talked to him the next year. I, I gave him our chart plotter um, and I ended up giving them Wilson, got to talk, made friends with them. They're still friends. They said that the ice was five feet thick last year when it broke up and they showed me pictures where they had pulled their barges up like 200 feet on the side of the, of the river and there were ice chunks five feet thick all around them. This is a very interesting part of the world. Uh, here's Peter putting some fuel in with the fuel truck in back. Um, here we are in Campsell Bend. This was one of the this is about second day on the river. And um, this was a beautiful area. Um, but, but I mean, the river is big. It goes from a thousand feet wide to miles wide in some areas. In some areas, it's six miles wide. And try to find a section of water that's deep in a six mile wide river that you don't have a chart for very tensing kind of a thing. And I do tense tension pretty well, but uh, Peter was really smoking a lot at this point. Here we <laughs> smoking go. what? Yeah, here, <laughs> we go. here we are just anchored. This is drone flight two and, uh, and uh, on drone four. Um, uh, no, this is still drone three. I think I, I, I had two drones with me. This is drone three, I, anyway. Uh, this is Campsell Bend again in the morning. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. really. These are about 4,000 foot high mountains. And you just drive along this river for days. I mean, and you, you, you don't see, you get near a village after 250 miles. Like, so from Seattle, Portland or Bellingham to Portland, you see a little village that's on like one or two acres. And it has maybe 40 homes that half of them have people living there all year. And uh, it's a very remote area, maybe one of the remote, remote, remote areas on, in, on the planet. Um, here we are, uh, beginning of 900 miles of cold weather. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it gets colder. Have you ever gone against a, a, you know, 25 knot wind when it's 40 degrees out? Yeah. And do that all day long? And um, this is what month again? This is July. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you How know. How are the bugs? You know what? It was cold and windy, so we didn't have our Bellini bugs. Um, you know, if you're anchored out, really very few bugs. Well, occasionally. Peter didn't like them. I just sprayed tons of bug spray and, and uh, went to bed. Um, when you're moving, it's no issue at all, most of the trip. But I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I brought my some of my snowmobile coats and some insulated gloves. It was just an afterthought. Um, but I also grabbed this. This was my dad's survival suit. And uh, and I just threw it in because the guys had told me it's going to be like 60 and it had been up to 80 up in Hay River. And I'm like, you know, I don't know, I'm going to the Arctic Ocean. I should grab some warm clothes. This thing saved my life. There were nights where I had to sleep in my survival suit to stay warm. I mean, it was, and we had a heater. Um, anyway, just a shot from the river here, really pretty. Um, and we had good weather. And this section, it was warm enough to shower. This is a little portable uh, hot water heater we had that Coleman made, ran on a little propane bottle it uh it worked intermittently so we were a little smelly at times we we never did quite figure out why it was what was intermittent about it but uh this ran off of a uh raw water pump so we pulled the river water in and then ran it through a filter and uh and then into the heater and took our showers and washed our clothes this is about uh three days in we met uh, uh, Alice and Anne, and they're kind of fellow adventurers. And this was one of two um, boats that we saw on the river. And uh, about an 18-foot canoe, they had uh, lots of stories of animals when they were camping. And they were really happy to see us. They'd been on the river for a month, and they were from uh, Victoria um, and super friendly. Um, and whenever we met up, we had, my wife had made this huge tub of Grandma Coldway's cookies, which are a special family recipe. And we had kokanees with us. So, you know, everybody, everybody we'd meet, we'd at least share a cookie and a kokanee. We got to ask Larry on the chat line for, uh, uh, for him to send his wife's cookie recipe. Oh, that's a family recipe. I don't know. All right. Right now, we're right? family. We're family. There's no one. Yeah. yeah we're, we're all family tonight. Oh, the right. cookies. They, they'd always ask for more. Kathy's cookies are amazing. Um, anyway, uh, this is a um, very interesting thing that we had to do every other day, basically. There's no fuel docks on this river. And the natives, um, and part of what uh, the, the Cooper Tug guys do is they come in in the, uh, once a year, they come in and resupply these villages and they have um, a way to fill up their, their fuel supply. But can you imagine moving 
140 gallons of fuel in five gallon jerry cans. Oh wow! Uh, oh, wow! Each into a truck. We these roller things we we made they turned out not to work, and but everybody would drive down on the beach and we we couldn't get to the beach and people would come and help us. They were super nice, just wonderful folks. But this is how we'd refuel, and sometimes we'd have to. They they'd spend two hours driving us around moving fuel for us. Um, Larry, what was it like interacting with their Department of Ecology? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, actually, everybody was uh, pretty conscientious of doing the right thing, Peter. I mean, uh, you never they, they, where you filled, they had a, a tray that would catch anything that spilled, and um, uh, you know, they may be out in the tule birds, but. These are smart people that are conscientious um, and and very well traveled too. It's uh, I mean, and they're and they're not poor at all. I mean, they're mostly new trucks, new aluminum boats. Um, you know, if they are working, they get paid a lot. If you um, aren't working, they have a, a. I think you get about four or five thousand a month if you're not working. Um, if you are working, they actually supplement your wages uh, by about $17 an hour over. If you're making 10, they pay you another 17 to encourage you to work. Um, and they need people up there for, for lots of different things. Again, a little, just a not, you just no, no idea what you're going to get into when you go to a place like this. Um, we were thinking we were going to see a lot of bears. This is a little black bear we saw the first one. And um, he was curious, stood up, looked at us and, uh, and, uh, just didn't see too many bears this on this particular trip. Here we are fueling again in Fort Good Hope. Um, and it's, uh, it, here we ended up in a little bay about five miles north of town. And then, and then uh, we met some uh, gal, Sheila, I think, that helped us uh, fuel our, our uh, boat and gave us a tour of town. Everybody would give us a driving tour of town and <laughs> we're real proud of it. There's a lot of this sort of style Catholic churches up there um and and uh, just nice folks uh this was she uh shelly and uh, she was flying her kite with her uh, uh niece or new and and niece and uh drove us in town helped us uh, even waited in town uh, the people there was a line are refueling here that was amazing because we were filling all these jerry cans the, the gas stations only open one hour a day and uh, we were 45 minutes loading up so anyway they stayed open took care of us um this was the Ekaloo. This is the uh, Canadian uh, buoy tender. And they go in and in the really tight spots, uh, they try to put buoys in. And they had, uh, the problem is that as soon as they put them in, the logs come down and they wash the buoys out of place. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, this was uh, Travis, the, the captain of the Ekaloo. He invited us on because I talked to him beforehand, getting advice and super nice guy, super helpful again. Um, and uh, this is, you see a problem here? Uh, which, which side do I go around? Yeah. This is like, what are we doing here? You know? <laughs> and whenever there were buoys like this, you know, the chart would show that there were supposed to be three more buoys, and we would be looking around trying to figure out, well, you know, they moved around, the chart's out of date, and we'd literally run around in circles trying to figure out, well, where is this darn channel? And if you got out of the channel, it got shallow really, really quickly. Um, this is a, this is crossing the Arctic circle and, uh, it's a cold day. It's like 40 degrees. The wind is coming right at us. If you look in the background there, there's a, about a two or three foot chop and, uh, yeah, it's really cold, but you know, Hey, we're happy. We've been to the Arctic circle. We've been driving the boat for about 10 hours at this point. And, uh, if you notice that uh, we're, we're drifting at 8.4 knots, the motors are in, at idle. So it would only be like two or three. So there's like a six knot current here. And it's about, I think, five feet deep there. So um, interesting place. Uh, this was Craig, another, uh, another uh, uh, guy we met that it was kayaking the river and um, also delighted. He'd been on the river for quite a while and was so tickled pink to get a cookie and a, and a kokanee. Um, good fun. Um, and that case behind is a, is a rifle. Um, you make it sound, I gotta go back to this. He loves the cookies. Oh, yeah, of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's called a human. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you use the rifle to get cookies? No, so there's a, <laughs> it's a very interesting area to go camping. You gotta be a special kind of person. So we got off the river about July 22nd or something like that. 
And um, about two weeks later, not far from where we met the girls, uh, a couple from Ontario was, uh, was camping there. And uh, you know the bear deal? Yeah. They got visited by a grizzly bear in the middle of the night and he was after in their tent and the husband went out and um, you know, basically challenged the grizzly bear with whatever he had. She Ooh. got, she jumped in the kayak and he didn't make it. Ooh. So um, this is a very scary kind of a place. It's beautiful and interesting, but dangerous too. So having a rifle, I think it's a smart move. Um, this was something I didn't expect. This was muskox and we saw them, uh, they're big. Uh, it turns out that we talked to the, the, the locals and they were like, yeah, they're huge, but it's like eight inches of fur all around. It said, if you actually shoot one, there, there's not much meat. Oh. Big animal, lots of fur, kind of probably needed if it's 47 below zero. Yeah. Um, this was uh, Arctic Red River. And here we're about two thirds of the way to the Arctic Ocean. And it's dead calm here in these shots. But that night, we were anchored in this river and our little fortress anchor held us, uh, we had probably 70, 75 knot winds that wow. night. And uh, I thought the canvas was gonna rip off. We're sleeping under that little bow cover there. And I was thinking the canvas was gonna blow off. We, that night beforehand, we were gonna try to eat dinner there. And uh, we tried everything we could think of to get the stove to, to light and stay lit. And it was so many, we just gave up and ate potato salad and cold meat. And that was that and went to bed, tried to, and we slept, we were tired. Beautiful though. Uh, another one of these really neat uh, uh, churches. Uh, Notice lots of uh, wildflowers. It was, it was really pretty. Um, I thought this was a good sign here. You know, this was right next to the Northern store and uh, the best place to go sledding, um, you know? So gotta have your sign, children, sledding. Uh, here we are, uh, this is one in the morning. We decided to stop for dinner. Do you guys notice it's- Wow. It, does that look like one in the morning? No, oh, wow. It, Looks like lunchtime. Yeah, and Peter, Peter mixed up breakfast for dinner here uh, with sliced ham. Gotta have Sam, but uh, uh, this was great fun. Uh, and then here we are, uh, a little bit of Spam. Looks like Spam. Just toasted brown, <laughs> perfect. You know, my grandpa used to teach me to do this. Um, I don't cook too much, uh, actually. Uh, here we are, we're anchored somewhere. I don't know, no actual cruising. So this is, the river's getting bigger as we go north. Um, here we are at Inuvik, um, and this is, uh, you know, like the big town right near, it's about 70, 80 miles from the Arctic Ocean. And this beach, um, so, you know, we've been run along and, and it's, we get there probably seven o'clock at night and everybody gets off work. They come down and they have jet skis and they're water skiing in the river. I mean, the river is cold and, uh, there's pontoon boats that arrive and it's just like, what's the deal? And they go out and they, you know, summer comes and the ice is only broken up two weeks before and they're out water skiing on the river. I mean, it's just really an interesting place and super friendly. Um, and uh, here's the Catholic church there. This one is a little bit different, um, special. Uh, this couple, uh, Kim and Connor, um, we met his uh, dad or their dad. Can you go back to that previous slide, Larry? I wanted to get a photo of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. Really an interesting spot. Thank um, you. But we met, uh, their dad helped us refuel at Fort Good Hope. And, uh, and then he gave us uh, the, the kids' phone number and said that Kim knows everyone in Inuvik and they'll know how to help you. And because and, our charts ended at Inuvik and we had to find some way to get some information because it's like the braids, it's 30 miles wide, 70 miles long and no chart at all. And, <laughs> and uh, so... Like anyway, through her friend network, we ended up meeting a, um, uh, a fishing captain that runs his boat all the way out to the Arctic Ocean, goes fishing, and and he had kept a Garmin inReach track line, and that ended up uh, becoming our our way to get north. Here we are refueling again. Um, we only got like this far with it, and then uh, it, the it's not here, but. It's an interesting town. So we knew we were trying to meet Connor. We tried to call Connor or Kim. Neither one answered the phone. I'm at the fuel dock asking um, 
uh, a guy in a big black truck if uh, if he had any idea of somebody that might be able to uh, you know that that could help us get fuel back and forth and we talked he goes sure I'll help guess what it was Connor <laughs> I'm telling you crazy things happen on these trips so this is our method of navigating the last 80 miles and uh, this is the uh, uh, in reach Garmin track line and uh, we got a we you know we got a guy to download it into um, Peter's iPad and that was how we navigated the, the last little bit and we tried as close as we could to stay to that this part of the river was really weird it would go from five feet deep you run along for a long ways at five feet shallow is really three feet deep and then in some of these bends it would go to 100 120 feet deep wow don't know why but it did uh yeah then again how in the world this is the chart in that area it really doesn't work um just bizarre but we made it here we are we're up to the arctic ocean and uh um this is just before we lost drone three um and it turns out drones don't work very well up north uh, the uh, compass there's not enough uh the compass doesn't work and the satellite signal is so weak you get the you get the drone up and it uh it's yeah really yeah larry blame Playing the drone, Larry. Smart. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not user error or user operator error. Drone, right? So we got yeah. some pictures and then I was trying to get Peter to uh, grab it with the fishing net. And he's like, look, just fly it in here. We'll get it. We got it in right up to the deal and it banged on the uh, gunnel. And, and instead of bouncing in, it bounced out and boom, we lost the drone. So thousand dollars down the drain. Uh, this was a pretty fun event here. So here we are. Uh, that was it. So uh, the next shots are kind of the return trip. Do we have time for that? Uh, yeah, we might run out of power on my laptop, but we can go through. <laughs> All right, we'll bank through the trip north. So now Peter has done the trip. We go back to Inuvik, and uh, and it and the trip really changes the whole complexion. First off, it warms up, which is good. And uh, this is the uh, Larry in the Arctic Ocean, the two of us still friends. Yeah. Uh, and then Peter flies out and my grandson Otto flies in and he's seven at this point. And Brandon, my son-in-law are, you know, they are the return crew, okay? And Otto's gung-ho and uh, Brandon's a master mechanic. And this is an interesting trip north. So there are kayakers and stuff to go down the river. Nobody that we ever talked to goes back up river with a boat that goes fast and uses fuel, I mean, so think about it. Now we're fighting a six to eight knot current um, for 1,200 miles up current. You have to be able to carry an amazing amount of cargo and get phenomenal fuel economy to fight a current for that kind of distance. There's some areas where the current's only a couple of knots, but a lot of it, you know, the, was was in that four to six knot range. Um, now this picture, I'm amazed that it doesn't look like a foggy zone because there's so many mosquitoes. Um, this is up at uh, Tuck on the Arctic Ocean. And uh, they drove up there and were out of the car for about 30 seconds, got this photo and got back in. Um, there are sled dogs up there. Um, this turns out the way uh, we talked to Travis the, and looked at how they've done this. This is how you actually anchor on the river when you have a current. You put one bow in, put your anchor out, and uh, let the current flow through. Works really well. So um, let me move this. this beeping on here. Um, so um, let's see. That, yeah, that's the anchoring system. If you can believe it, we saw a porcupine when we walked up the beach here. Um, and uh, you get a feel for the, 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 the lay of the land. Um, here we are. Jerry cans, this refueling thing just turns out to be an awful lot of work, but uh, yeah, that's what you gotta do. You're gonna do an adventure. Um, this is Otto, he's, he's just, uh, he's been chasing around the deck, killing flies with his little battery powered fly killer. And uh, he just ran out of gas after a while. Here we are refueling on one of the long hops. We only had to use this bladder tank one time. And, and it, I don't know if you guys have ever used bladder tank, but you know, bladder tanks full of fuel. And uh, I was thinking that we could just put the hose connected and uh, and sit on the bladder tank. We'd push the fuel up the hill and into the tank. Well, because I didn't want to get a siphon kind of thing going, right? 
So I sit on the tank. It doesn't do anything. I get auto. He sits on the tank with me. It doesn't go. Then Brandon and I get on it and we all bunch up on it. We're sitting on Oh, There's three of us trying to get this thing to push the fuel up the hill. It turns out if you do the math, you can't get it to do that. So we ended up lowering the hose to the deck level and getting the fluid, fluid into it. And then, and then while we were sitting on the tank, pushing it up and in, I, I, you know, I had a transfer pump, but I didn't want to do it, but, but I, it was interesting. Three big guys sitting on a plastic bag of fuel seemed like it would have pushed it up the hill. Peter didn't, well, Peter wasn't there to smoke. So I guess that was okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this is Otto and uh, grandpa on the, hill, on the, on the river here. I'll never forget that trip, will you? Yeah, no. And he's, uh, he's, written stories about it in school and all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is uh, the lower ramparts um, and, uh, you know, big sandy area. Here we are with Wilson and Otto crossing the Arctic Circle. Um, pretty crazy. Uh, this is the uh, marina at Norman Wells. So here the river is like six miles wide. And, uh, and this is the, they put this in and now you have your marina. Ready to go. Okay. All right. Floating dock. Floating dock, you know? Uh, yep. Uh, Grandpa ran out of gas here. We would take turns sleeping. As the sun never goes down and you tend to go, go, go. And, and at a certain point, you run out of gas. Um, here's Brandon refueling um, while we're driving down the bay. Uh, this is everyone's run out of gas. <laughs> All right. Here we are in a place called the Ramparts. This was gorgeous and uh, these huge sandstone cliffs and it's super deep there, you know, I mean, you know, at least 20 feet, which is super deep in this river. And, uh, and I'm in the little rubber boat with the uh, uh, camera. So this is Sand Salt Rapids and um, the canoe guide that we had, um, talks about this and it's an area where the river is about a quarter mile wide and then it goes out into this big bay and starts to drift north. There's a big bend in the river and if you take what looks like the right way, right near the shore, it leads you into an area of boulders and about 25 people have, have passed away at these sand salt rapids. Wow. The, the right way to go is you keep going farther west about another mile and a half. And again, so far, you can't see the buoys and the buoys are bent over in the current where you can't can't do it. Uh, you can't see them. So and the channel in this area is only that's deep. It's only about uh, maybe 70 feet wide max. Um, there were a lot of the when it, sometimes you'd see these huge birds. This is a bird that's like five feet high um, and uh I guess it's Canadian ostrich. I don't know. Uh, they always come in pairs. Uh, this was Shailene. These northern store people, they were the best tour guides uh, in the Northwest Territories. They were the birds smoking, up. Larry? Pardon me? Were the birds smoking? No. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, the Shailene gal opened her store for us um, and then hauled us around for fuel. And what a store manager. Again, we were an adventure for her that day. Uh, super nice folks. Uh, this was, uh, we went to the dump and uh, we were supposed to be able to see the bears at the dump, but they'd already eaten everything. So all we saw was the snowmobile, you know, dump yard, um, kind of fun. Brandon and I snowmobile. Here is Otto. And uh, if you look, uh, you can see a fly in the picture there in the center. And, uh, and Otto had a fantastic time getting flies. And Wilson is there too. And uh, this is an interesting shot. Look at the wake off the boat. We're moving along here up current at about 24 knots or so. And, and uh, this is a typical high speed displacement hull um, catamaran, very unusual. But again, that wake is what you spend all your money, you know, and you know, you're basically your visa is moving water around. And the reason we get better fuel economy is we do it really efficiently. Um, and now it's gotten calm and warm. And here we, this is the day where we've got bugs and we are so lucky. This is 16 days in and, uh, and we have to put up the bug net. Kathy made this out of those bug nets that you put over king size beds. Yeah. She sewed three of them together and she tested if she had it all right by putting it over her car hmm. and in the garage and then adjusted. And we put this up inside and, and sealed up the bugs I'm telling you what, these bugs wanted in bad. 
I mean, there, it was literally, you know, 25% covered in bugs and, and mosquitoes at, at that night. And uh, we got up the next morning and they, they had basically killed themselves trying to get in. We had, we had literally the decks covered in bugs, a uh, quarter of an inch thick. Um, Kathy's great for cookies, for bug nets. Man, you married, yeah, I married, you married well. I married good. And she's gorgeous and smart to boot. She is. I can talk to that. <laughs> uh let's see hey, larry larry uh, our uh, our wise crowd tonight has pointed out uh byron and simone that it was a sand or is a sand hill crane oh is that oh, what it is yeah, oh. cross that off they, of your... they go that far north huh apparently i'll have to look that up they were really interesting to, to and and uh, always in pairs um did you guys see what's on the dash here that's a pie grandpa always has to have a pie nice you know? So that's it. The main base food, the, the uh, core food groups are spam. spam, sliced ham, potato salad, and apple pie. I, I want to think about this next trip you invited <laughs> me on. All right. Uh, here we are. We pulled the boat out. We've dismantled it. And we are ready to roll south. And, uh, and we killed a lot more bugs with the windshield of that truck than okay. you can ever imagine. I mean, okay. it was literally gray when the truck got home. Um, and we also wore the tires out on this trip. Um, the, uh, the, uh, on the trailer or the truck, the trucks, they do, um, they do the, uh, um, chip, chip seal roads. Yeah. And you know, it's crushed gravel Yeah. and it never gets warm enough that the, the uh, chip seal, um, sink never in. sinks in. Yeah. And so, Wait, so literally I got place. back from this trip in July, the, the tires, uh, I mean, I literally had to buy new tires, um, you know, and so uh, anyway, uh, that was it. That's that's the uh, wow, what a Arctic trip. adventure. What a trip. <laughs> and another Catholic <laughs> church. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's it. That's amazing, Larry. I like I said, I'm not sure I want to go on the next one, but especially yeah. around Cape Horn. But uh, uh -huh. uh, I can see why it's on the list. This is fantastic. So for any of you interested in going to the Arctic Circle, Larry can be reached at Aspen Power Yachts, but you're, you can only do it in an Aspen boat. <laughs> so. All right. Any questions at all? You know, Larry, it's remarkably quiet on the chat. You must have everyone spellbound at home. Or <laughs> <laughs> hungry for Gotta cookies. Have some adventure in life. Exactly. What a treat. Thank you, Larry. Hey, Mark, while I'm thinking, what's up tap for next week? What are we going to do? Well, I'm not going to be here, and neither are you. No. So we've got... Uh... Oh. David. Well, we can uh, answer that one. So uh, oh. we had uh, a week ago, we had uh, a week ago, I guess it was, we had uh, the topic we had was getting internet on your boat. And uh, Doug Miller was with us. And uh, that was a very popular uh, topic. We had so many questions on that. We've lined up a speaker for next week. And the speaker is Steve Mitchell. And he's with CBITS, and uh, he's going to address the topic of how to get internet on your boat, as well as some other topics in the electronics area. So join us for that and learn how you can get. You know, this isn't just your standard internet stuff; it's the broad, big broadband stuff. He's talking about getting streaming on your boat uh, so that you can watch videos and TV and whatever you want to do, and, and probably do Zoom calls on the on the uh, on the internet too. So next week coming up. Excellent. Landon's are in charge, and probably George uh, Harris is going to be a co-host with the Landons, and uh, Peter and I are going to be vacating. Yes. Where are you going, Mark? I can't remember. I'm going to Sarasota, Florida. Very nice. Good, so good. I'll, I'll, on a, uh, April 8th, I'll try to do a boating report from uh, Sarasota. It's just like Larry's trips. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure they have spam in Florida. That's about the end of the year. They uh, do. And manatees. Yeah. Manatees. manatees. Go. <laughs> I'm going to try to well, get excellent. it. Well, Larry, yeah. I spent a lot of time with you today and yesterday, and all these days kind of run together, but it's been great fun. Yeah. 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 We're looking at episode 39. That was Sissy Spacek was the host of okay. Saturday Night Live. She was in a show recently, which I found quite enjoyable, Bloodlines, which has some boating references. There's a boat yard involved. That's on Netflix. And Larry, your presentation reminded me of the uh, the Grizzly Man documentary. Have you seen that? No. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I'll put it in the chat. It's available on YouTube uh, for free. Tell them Peter sent you. But yeah, it's a fun documentary about this guy that gets to befriend grizzly bears before he's, well, watch the movie. 
perfect i love yeah, it that's excellent yeah. it's about 10 years old or so but yeah uh Werner herzog i believe directed it so there huh. you go okay landon it's always great to see you i'll see you in a few weeks you keep a hold on things let's keep this puppy together all right all right you bet and all right good night mark good night larry good night everybody good night thank you good night